If I die tomorrow, I hope you hear these words. I ain't here to flip no birds or sip no syrup. Hope the future generations can get this urge. Stay woke, youngin', and avenge these nerds. Uh. Welcome back to another episode of Nerds of the Rounds, guys. It's your host, Sebastian. It's your boy, Law. Anybody tone from across the hall. We got a great career series. Plus, we also are doing a little bit of a Kickstarter party um, for <laughs> the awesome Jeff Ryder. But before we bring him in and talk more with Jeff, we're going to hit play on a preview for the Kickstarter that we're going to talk about today. So guys, without further ado, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. We want to bring in the founder of Crowd Wrangler Studios and the creator behind Major Holmes and Captain Watson, Jeff Ryder. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Hey, what's up? Thanks for coming on. Yeah, stoked. So Jeff, um, let our viewers know who you are, our listeners, um, how you got Give involved. Give us the, the origin comics. story. Yes. yes. Oh Your God, my origin, origin story? story. <laughs> that's, a, that's, listen, a, listen, that's always our first like, big I question. come from a galaxy far, far away. No. <laughs> <Nice>. um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my name is Jeff Ryder and I am a comic book writer now, which is pretty cool. Um, I started writing you say comics. That as if you weren't always a comic book writer. I wasn't, honestly. Um, I, I majored in creative writing in school way back in the day. I've been a storyteller since I could speak, pretty mm -hmm. much. Um, but I spent a lot of years doing other things. I loved uh, comics okay. growing up, and I read comics since I could read books. And uh, back, I think Larry Hama's G.I. Joe series was like my Ooh. first steal it from the, com from the grocery store comic book, like way back in the 80s. Oh, makes me old and um, <laughs> date myself there a little bit. But uh, yeah, I, I, I have tried writing novels and I mean, I have written novels and I've written a lot of other things and I've had some different jobs and uh, maybe seven or eight years ago, maybe a little more than that. I um, was kind of struggling with what I wanted to do with my life creatively, professionally, and, and the kind of things that I wanted to be writing. I wasn't writing things I was happy with. And my wife's first, she doesn't remember this, but she said to me one day, why don't you write comic books? You're the biggest dork that I know. And I was like, <laughs> why don't I write comic books? That's a really good idea. I read that comic books. My closet is filling up corner. with comic books. Why, why haven't I ever tried this? And I think it was, there was a degree to which I was a little afraid to get into like a medium that I didn't know what the underbelly looked like, right? Like I could tell a story, that's not a big deal, but making things and writing scripts and writing comics is a skill set that I didn't have, that I didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. um, beyond having read them my whole life. Like I, I never, I wasn't one of those kids who grew up making his own comics over and over and over again. I, it just, it, it wasn't my thing. It was sort of too insular, I think. And then as I got older, I got into playing music and was in bands and I figured out that I like collaborative stuff, waking things with other people. But when I was writing, I was writing by myself and writing in a hole. And like I said, it was sort of stuck. Mm -hmm. um, so I got into like, look, I was like, okay, cool. How do let's figure out how do you make comics? What, what's, what's involved in making comics? What is scripting like? And what is, what are the rules and what kind of processes do you have to follow and all that stuff? 
uh, because I know some folks that have some friends who like do some screenwriting and who work in film and television and, and different things. And those rules are very strict and very specific, right? Writing screenplays is this very polished thing and writing for television is this very format based sort of deal. And so I was a little nervous. And then I got into comics and found out there are no rules. <laughs> like you can <laughs> do nothing. whatever you want. And I was like, oh, 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 I can do any, okay, I'm in. I gotta try this, I gotta figure it out. Um, and so I started doing some comics journalism for a little while. I wrote uh, reviews like a lot of people would do getting started. I wrote for a site uh, that looked at comics and pop culture through the lens of like issues around social inclusion and stuff. Okay. And so I was doing a weekly series of reviewing books like crazy and, and that kind of thing. And that let me go to some cons on the press pass for free. So I started going to some cons on the West coast where I was living at the time. And uh, to kind of peek under the hood, cause you never know, like maybe the industry's gross and maybe you don't want to be part of it. <laughs> and I know. <laughs> and I got there and I realized like I hadn't been to a comic con since I was a kid. And I, I went to my first show and like two, again in like 2010, I think. And I was like, Again, whoa, like what have I been doing with my life? Why was I not here all of this time? These are my people. This is my, oh my God. And it kind of jump started in my whole life. Like I kind of got back into uh, uh, t doing the kind of story time that I was crazy about and not kind of the stuff I, I thought I should be doing, but the kind of stuff I really wanted to do. And it kind of steamrolled from there. I started making short comics and I started meeting artists at cons and uh, just saying, hey, who wants to take this crazy idea of mine and make it into a thing and learning how to collaborate with artists and ask them what they're into drawing and match my stuff to their style. And and one thing led to another. And now I'm writing a couple different series. Let's get into the Major Holmes and Captain Watson series. So looking at this, you've already had a successful Kickstarter for issue one and two. Yes. And you have a great collaborative team um, with you, which is um, Ishmael Canales, who is the artist, Roger um, Soroka, who's the colorist, and Justin Birch, who's also a learner. How did you assemble this team together to work on this series? And again, what was that like, that process for you? It's a, oh, speaking of long stories, man, you guys are going to get me going tonight. Um, <laughs> For it's it. fun because uh, Major Holmes was a thing I wanted to do since I was really young. I grew up reading Sherlock Holmes. My grandmother used to give me, uh, uh, my grandmother was a librarian and she used to give me like adventure fiction for my birthday. Uh, Treasure Island and uh, Three Musketeers and, and Sherlock Holmes. My, like my original Sherlock Holmes copies are copies my grandmother gave me. Okay. Um, so I wanted to do something in that world for a long, long time. When I got into comics and when Sherlock Holmes suddenly became public domain, I started talking to these various artists at shows trying to find somebody who was into it. And I met an artist who done a lot of graphic noir detective-y kind of stuff. Uh, this guy named Michael Dorman out on the West Coast. And he looked at it. And he's like, man, this sounds like a really cool idea. I don't want to do this. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> and he's like, no, I've got tons and tons of that in my portfolio. We should do something different. But let me introduce you to a friend of mine. I said, okay, cool. He introduced me to an artist named Carlos Caballero. Carlos and I did a webcomic version of Major Holmes in 2008. 12 or 13 um and we tried to run it on patreon and didn't kind of go very well um but he i can't tell a story without talking about carlos because he did all the original character designs he decided mm -hmm. how the guys were going to look and what was going to happen and then he ended up doing some different things and he he draws star wars cards for tops now and does some really really awesome stuff but he's not doing sequential book things as far as i know anymore and i decided i didn't want to do it as a digital i wanted to make it a full-on print book like really just go bonkers with it um, so I cobbled together the stuff that we had and made kind of a floppy to show off to people. And I went to New York Comic Con and I was walking around and I met a guy in Artist Alley who recommended an agency to me called Bootsido. The, the, the owner of the Bootsido agency is really awesome. And I reached out to him and he said, you know, I've got a stable of guys that work for me all over the world. Um, what are you interested? What's your style like? What's your story about? And so I gave him the breakdown on Major Holmes and Captain Watson, how it's about Sherlock Holmes's nephew, who's a spy during World War I. It's very period-centric. It's very realistic. It's not steampunk. It's, it's historical fiction, just about. And so I wanted somebody who was tight on the realism and could really nail some of the details. And um, he pointed me at two or three guys, and Ishmael Canales was one of them. When I got into looking at his portfolio, he did a book called Athena Voltaire at Action Lab, which is kind of this lady Indiana Jones thing, which is really, really cool. It's written by a guy named Steve Bryant. 
Okay. And I started reading that. I was like, this is kind of the jam I'm going for with a little less monsters and a little more realism. And so I reached out to Ishmael and said, hey, man, your agent hooked me up. What do you think about this story? And he read it and he was like, when can we start? How do we get this done? This nice. is awesome. I totally want to do this because he had come off of Dina Voltaire and was working on like a superhero thing. And he wanted to like juxtapose that stuff that he was doing together. Okay. Um, he knew the colorist. He and Roger are a team. They do a lot of stuff together. Roger also worked on the Athena Voltaire book. And they're both in Spain. And so they got cranking on uh, essentially taking the webcomic that we had done and the script from the originals and reworking it and creating a new version of the same story, basically. So the issue one that was available in the first Kickstarter is very similar to what used to be in the webcomic. Some of the dialogue has changed because the art was different and some of the shots are different. He, they didn't recreate the old thing shot for shot. They drew their own stuff and it's very natural. But they based it on Carlos's original character. And so every issue of Major Home still has Carlos's name in it as our, as our character designer because he contributed a ton. Okay. But they just sort of took it and made it into this great big badass world. And <laughs> those guys are so much fun to work with like creatively. Like we have these conversations about lights versus every time Roger is nuts for like the period lighting and like, let's have a whole fight scene that only happens by the headlight of old model T trucks and the gunfire because there, there's no overhead lighting in London in 1914. So we have to find ways to get real. Crazy. And, like, and he's like, let's do a whole thing on the rooftops where it'll all be gray and smoky and gross. And I was like, okay, I was going <laughs> to, but you want to be outside? We'll write the thing outside. That sounds great because those guys are so jazzed about let's put this physical element or let's do these specific motorcycles or these kind of weapons or whatever. And, um, like the things they want to draw that they're stoked about inform the story. And so fun things are from the story that even I hadn't thought about necessarily at the beginning because these guys are having a good time and really want to draw this stuff. So. I think that does explain a the lot of the attention to detail is like so there. You guys have yeah. a lot of it from the writing it, to the to the art. It's you can tell that you guys took your time with it. It is research intensive. It's more than I thought I was ever getting myself into (laughs) because with Sherlock Holmes and anything that's a Sherlock Holmes spinoff, which is really what we are, there's a fan base for that stuff and they are specific. And people that are into mysteries and detective fiction are always looking for the clues. They're always trying to figure out the ending. And if you don't layer in those details for them, you're not doing a very good job in that, that specific mystery kind of storytelling. They'll also eat you alive if you get it wrong. <laughs> so you have to be really, really detail-oriented. Then we folded in this whole historical fiction and political intrigue of the, the period that we're in thing. And that's a whole other level of research that you have to get right. And, and because that particular fan base can be a little nitpicky, if the trucks look a little bit wrong or the neighborhoods look a little bit wrong, you know, they're going to call you out on it. And we want to be as sweet as we can. I think Ishmael found photos of the actual neighborhood in london that i just plucked the name off of a map and decided they were close enough together oh, that it would work wow. and wow. found period photos of like what the buildings in that neighborhood looked like before he started drawing the building that blew up and <laughs> <laughs> this being a sherlock after after the last set of books of sherlock is essentially everything that was written considered canon and backstory for your for yes. your we attempted to not only put our story in the historical context of world war one and what was going on in europe at the time but also in Conan Doyle's canon. Um, Sherlock Holmes does not appear as a character in our story, and there are legal issues that you have to be careful with that. Um, But Mycroft Holmes does. Um, There are some very small, minor Holmes characters that we're going to drag in one by one, but mostly we wanted to make complete original characters. I wanted to do... My dream of it from the very beginning was that it's, it's Sherlock Holmes meets James Bond. It's a little bit detective and a little bit espionage, and it blends some of these uh, British heroes together into this one big thing. So we wanted to create a new Holmes and a new Watson, and we wanted to figure out ways to make them completely original and completely unique. So while they exist in Doyle's world, and, and all of Doyle's facts are our facts, you don't have to have read everything that Sherlock Holmes ever did to follow the story. Mm. You don't have to totally know what's going on. If you're vaguely familiar with Sherlock Holmes, you'll get most of it. I mean, people know who Holmes and Watson are, so it's not a big deal. No, you definitely hit the hit that mark with Sheffield. Sheffield is completely different from what we're used to in seeing Sherlock. And you, you know, saying that whole James Bond aspect to it, that that brash, young, hot shot, you you get that uh, from him, especially in some of those some of those scenes where he's just overly confident. They're, and they're like, mm. what's what's going on with this guy? Yeah. <laughs> is he so overly confident? Just make it up. I'll figure it out what you mean. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> There's a, there's a, yeah, that's a fun scene. There's a, a rooftop sniper battle 
and they're making up codes yes. on the fly. And <laughs> he's like, wait a minute, what do you mean make it up on the fly? And he's like, don't worry about it. I'm smart. I'll figure it out. And uh, <laughs> it's one of the underlying themes of the book that was actually really important to me. I like all of the various Sherlock pastiches that are out there. I think the BBC series and Cumberbatch is great. Um, I enjoyed Elementary, the one that they did on American TV. I've seen some others. But there's an underlying theme in a lot of those stories that the brilliant detective is also broken. That because he's such a genius, he's also totally screwed up. And there's a degree of anti-intellectualism in that that really rankles me. He can be super confident and very aware of his own abilities and still be relatively nice to people. I mean, he's still going to be brash and he's still going to be arrogant. He's a young hothead or whatever. Um, but we wanted our detective, our homes, to be different than the homes that people understand. We really wanted to create something original. And we wanted to celebrate him for being smart. The other dynamic that was really important to us was I wanted the Holmes and Watson that were equals. If there's a single thing in the original canon that bugs me, it's that Watson follows Holmes around like a lap dog. Yeah. And just, oh, Holmes is so great, and Holmes is X, and Holmes is Y. The function of the way novels worked at the time that that was written was that's how things got written. People didn't fully have an understanding at the time that somebody would tell someone else's story from afar, whatever. There had to be a reason. A lot of novels are written as series of letters or communications back and forth. And so the, the character of Watson sort of functions to tell you why Sherlock Holmes is walking around and doing all this stuff. He's basically the narrator. But it also makes him a little bit of a fanboy in his own story. And where he's just constantly talking about how great Holmes is. And we decided, or I decided in particular, and then, and then Ishmael and the guys really were serious about it. We wanted our Watson to be Holmes as equal in every way that we could think of. And sometimes even better than him at certain things. Um, you know, we wanted them to be partners. We wanted them to be friends. We wanted them to have intrigue back and forth because they're both spies. So they trust each other to a point because they're mm -hmm. spies. Um, and so we took, a, we took our Watson and we made him, made him just as smart, just as deductive, maybe even a little more aggressive and violent. Like she's not afraid to whip out her guns. And she's American and Amer yes. we're Americans. We love yeah. our guns. Um, <laughs> I get to layer in my American anti-gun uh, beliefs into, into a story that's full of spies and soldiers and whatever. Um, but, uh, and, and, and it led well, to a- brings it up and makes it a point to point out how American she is every chance he gets. Oh yeah. 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 He's never going to let her live it down. And, <laughs> If it was a TV show or something else, you would hear the accents and she'd be the only one who was using the American accent. So you would know if he doesn't point it out periodically in a comic book, you're not going to pick it up. If I said it at the beginning and then you didn't read it in issue two or issue three, you might miss it. Um, mm. I, you know, we refer to her in the promo as his mysterious American partner over and over and over again because we want everybody to understand. As we start revealing more about each character's backstory through the different series that we're trying to, that we're hopefully going to be able to pull off, you'll learn why she's specifically American and how she's connected to the American intelligence services and the, and the Holmes family. There are some secrets of that already in here that you might need to know some Sherlock canon, but we're going to get around to all of that eventually. I like what you also did with the book too, which gives it that, that feel, which I, I, I'm assuming we're going to see in the three issues, three and four is the, the top secret briefs that you also had at the end. What was the whole idea with that um, to add to that flavor to the comic? Um, well, it was a little bit of kind of an overall marketing idea. Um, one of the cool things that we'd came up with, uh, there's a, a writer that you guys probably know named Ian Mondrick. He put out a book called Tomb of the Red Horse, and he and I were having conversations about how if Kickstarter rewards come in really cool packaging, it's that much more fun, right? Um, if you get a Kickstarter package in the mail and it looks all beat to shit, you're like, uh-oh, my book's in trouble. If you get a Kickstarter book in the mail and it's got this big branded logo on the front of it, you're like, yay, my thing is here. And so we wanted to put a little bit of that in it and we got to talking about it. And I thought, well, what if the packaging was part of the story? What if it came in a secret file that was like stamped top secret on the outside of it and had the little case number on the front of it, the way you see in, in detective movies and whatever. And um, I was watching an episode of The Crown with my wife and they like undercover the secret British government file. And it came in one of those like string and button envelopes where you twist the thing off. <laughs> I was like, what if we made those and shipped the books in those? How cool would that be in the direct thing? Issue three opens with Brick's secret and the, the identity of what's going, on, what's going on with Brick's identity and what he's protecting. Then we get into yet another gunfight in the streets of, of London, which is always awesome. Um, then a discussion in the secret lair under the Diogenes Club of uh, the clues found at Sherlock Holmes's house. We said Sherlock wasn't a character in our story, and that's true, but that doesn't mean that you don't get to see him for a minute or two, um, especially if you've seen the last page of issue two. Um, 
So as they're going through his effects, as it were, they discover some codes and some clues. Sherlock knew more about the Moriarty than he let on, and he may have said all this rolling from the background. He has hidden clues that he knows his nephew and his nephew's partner are smart enough to find that other people won't. And when they discover that, that pushes them into action in a very specific, really cool uh, historical uh, place in London that these guys got to draw that they were really excited about. There's this whole, we talked about before, this rooftop sniper battle that's a, a, in a, a place called the Hempstead Observatory in London. So it's this huge glass dome on the top of this building. And, and there's going to be some crazy stuff that happens on those rooftops. And then that action will lead us into issue four, which is a jumbo-sized 36-page almost double issue. Oh, you got nice. the working. Nice. Yeah, we gotta we gotta get the like the ending has to hit and it's it's big, 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 big things are happening. And some of the things are happening again, we're talking about history. Some of the things are happening you know. The things you don't know have to be a big deal. And so we wanted that last issue to really be like a great big old blockbuster. It's it's like the Deathly Hallows had to be two whole movies. That's that's kind of <laughs> what we're doing. We're like this is the big blind, we're just gonna get it done. There's an early bird tier that's got a bunch of cool swag in it that's real similar to the last swag. Like we said, uh, last time people who were, were super into the junk uh, got the, the cool file folder with all the cool things in it. There's going to be three or four new ones that you can add to your file folder to sort of complete the whole case file. There's some fun sort of realistic style World War I things. We found some guys that are going to do like the officer's notebook like an officer would carry in his front pocket in his field to, nice. to write notes and whatever. It's stamped with the six special – the six – Special Investigative Service logo on the front of it, um, which is the group that they're all a part of. Um, we're going to do enamel pins of the insignia like they would wear on their uniform. And then by the end of the book, the patches that we did for the last one in the insignia pins become part of the character's costumes or uniforms, or whatever, in the thing. So it's not just a cool piece of swag. It's a piece of swag that literally exists in the book as well as in real life. So you'll have one just like he has one, which we thought was fun. Um, there are going to be limited numbers of discounted tiers for that. There's also going to be a limited number, I think, 15 um, books on the first day that are, or packages on the first day or discounted tiers. Guys, make sure you guys hit that link. Let's get this done. Let's get it fully funded. Let's get these issues out. The first arc is fun, and it's a great mystery story, but it's just the beginning. 